Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another lecture of EE102. So in today's lecture, um, we're going to continue our last lecture on the Fourier series, but this time from the opposite perspective. Before I begin, let me go over some quick announcements. Uh, by tradition, the fourth homework is going to be due this Friday. Now, the coronavirus shelter is really dragging on, so I wonder if we should revisit this because I know a lot of people are going out for groceries, they have limited hours, uh, and frankly, other things on their mind. But we can't stop the learning. So we might actually get more learning if we give more time for the homework. So I'm thinking of extending it to Sunday for each weekly homework, no questions asked. And those who can get it in by Friday, which is the original class pace that was recommended by our department in previous years, uh, those who can meet that pace get a small amount of extra credit. And since this class is not, uh, you know, essentially not curved, uh, that might be useful. So please vote in the Piazza poll that I set up by Monday night. Uh, one issue I'd like you to be sensitive also about is midterm grading. So this is a large class with a lot of diverse students. And some students, they either have time zone difficulties or a personal consideration, such as the Center for Equal Accessibility to Education. Um, and so for these students, the university allots them extra time for exams, which means that uh, and in, in so certain cases, like we are seeing for this course, that extra time can be significant. It can be uh, uh, order of multiple times the allotted time. So for example, some students get, let's say 5x the time that other students get because of the Center for Accessibility. That means that if the exam is one day, then they get five days for it. And so for these students, uh, when we grade the exams, we also want to have the readers have all the exams together so they can grade them. So we're gonna start grading once we get all the exams. So if there's any delay in getting your midterm grades, I just wanted to give you transparency to let you know where that is coming from. Okay, let's begin. So in the last lecture, uh, these were the main mathematical results. We had this function or signal f of t, and it was well behaved with some period t naught, some fundamental period. And we say that if this signal is indeed well behaved, then f of t can be written as a Fourier series uh, that takes this, this form of equation. It's basically a sum of complex exponentials, uh, e to the jk omega naught t, that is being scaled by some constant ck, some scalar constant. And uh, we can write that in summation form. And today what we're going to do is we're actually going to go from this equation, which was from the last lecture, and try to move to the inverse problem. And the inverse problem is to try to recover CK, right? So let me go to the next slide here. In the last lecture, once again, I'm just going to write it out. We had this equation, F of T equals some summation over K of CK E to the J K omega naught T, right? We had this from the last lecture. Now, all I'm telling you is that if f of t is well behaved, I can write it as this infinite summation. But I have not told you what the coefficients ck are. So in today's lecture, we're going to see how do we actually go and find the ck, right? How do we actually get the ck? And in order to do that, we need to make two assumptions. The first assumption that we need to make is that the signal f of t uh, can indeed be written as a sum of complex exponentials. So this is just from the last lecture. And then the second part of the derivation is given the assumption, we find the CK such that we can represent F of T that way. So before we proceed, let's introduce a mathematical trick that's gonna simplify our derivation. Remember that when we deal with the complex exponential with some frequency omega naught, we can convert to period by just uh, uh, taking the ratio of 2 pi divided by omega naught. Now, if we consider this complex exponential shown right here in our Fourier series, 
Well, we can study two different cases. When k equals zero, this is just going to simplify to one. So we could have kind of a special derivation for identifying c sub zero. Right? Remember c sub zero, so if you look at the summation, if k is zero, then if k is zero, so if this was c sub zero, then e to the j k omega naught t is going to equal e to the j zero omega naught t. And this is simply going to equal c sub zero. All right, so for the special case of c sub zero, we have this uh, sort of easier case to consider, right, where the complex exponential is simply equal to one. Now, we also need to consider all the other k's that are not equal to zero, and so we break that into a separate case. And in that particular situation, we know by Euler's that e to the jk omega naught t is going to be equal to this summation just by expanding Euler's. All right, so we have these sort of two criteria here. Now, we can also look at this uh, integration of the complex exponential. So if I were to take the complex exponential and integrate it over a period, what do we get? Okay. So I want you to just take a quick look. Those of you who would like to, you can pause the video and see if you can actually compute this integral. Right, we've gone from the left-hand side in the left-hand side here. We start with just the integral of that complex exponential. Right, we simply integrate it over a period. And here, all we've done is we've just substituted uh, the uh, 2 pi over t naught instead of omega naught. Okay, so we've just done that trivial substitution. So now, if you want to complete it, you should try to see what this would equal. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can check your understanding by computing this integral. OK, welcome back. So in this particular case, we are asking a CYU question. CYU is compute the integral. And here, what we actually have is this is going to equal the integral t naught to t naught plus capital T naught. And if I, the first way I would integrate this, if it were me, is I would simply expand out Euler's. So some of you may have done this. You simply do cosine of, in this particular case, 2 pi k over t naught times lowercase t dt plus j times the integral of t naught t naught plus capital t naught sine of 2 pi k t naught t dt and this, this is equal to, well, let's see what this, this is equal to. So if I want to compute this integral, let's consider two cases, all right? Let's consider case one in red. So let's say if k equals zero, let's consider these two separate cases. And if k not equal to zero. All right, so what we will do is we will draw a box here so we have some space to work with and use red. So if k equals zero, then this integral is nothing but the integral of t naught, t naught plus capital T naught. Now remember, if k is zero, then it would be cosine of zero, which is one. So I'm just going to simplify that to one. Plus j times the integral t naught, t naught plus capital T naught. And sine of zero is zero. OK, 
okay? And this integral is therefore going to equal t naught. So therefore, if k equals zero, then this integral expression of the complex exponential equals t zero. Now, what if k is not equal to zero? So let's say that k is not equal to zero. Then in this particular case, we're going to have the integral t naught, t naught plus capital T naught cosine of 2 pi kt over t naught dt plus j integral t naught t naught plus capital T naught sine of 2 pi kt over t naught dt. So we have that same original integral, but now we know that k is not equal to zero. So in this particular case, we can also simplify the integral, right? We can look at this integral and we know that for, for intuitively what this is saying is I'm gonna integrate, let's take this for example. What this is saying is that I'm integrating cosine over a period. So integrating cosine over a period equals zero. And by that same logic, this also equals zero, right? So if I integrate a cosine over exactly one period, no matter where I start, I'm always going to end up uh, with uh, a summation of zero, right? Over one cycle or one period of a cosine or a sinusoid. Therefore, this integral expression is t naught when k equals zero and zero when k is not equal to zero. Okay, so now we have some understanding of what the integral of a complex exponential is in the Fourier series. So we can move on to the actual derivation of the Fourier series coefficients. So in this particular case, let's uh, assume that f of t can be broken down into the summation ck e to the jk omega naught t. And what that really requires is that requires, once again, that f of t is periodic with a single fundamental period, with a fundamental period t naught. And in the homeworks, when you are asked to calculate for your series, it might help to identify, like if you have a more complicated function uh, that's given to you, you'll want to first identify what t naught is, because that's very helpful when you try to form for your series. Right, because that allows you to define, like for example, omega naught and so on. All right, but for now, let's assume that that period is simply t naught. Now, in order to derive uh, ck, let's just stare at this equation for a little bit. Right, I have some function f of t that's given to me, and I know its fundamental period. So I, I know like omega naught, right, because omega naught is 2 pi over the fundamental period. So I have a good measure, I have a good handle on the terms that are here and a good handle on the terms that are here. And I'm trying to actually go ahead and find the C case, right? That is my goal. So I wanna isolate CK, I just wanna do some simple algebra. Now, if I just stare at this for a little bit and I wanna do some algebra, as soon as I, and this is a common theme in signal processing, as soon as you see a complex exponential and you wanna get rid of it, right? You want if you wanna, our goal is to sort of get rid of this so we just have CK on the right-hand side. If we want to get rid of it, then all we have to do is multiply it by, you know, e to the minus uh, of what you had, right? So e to the a times e to the minus a is going to equal e to the zero is going to equal one. So in this particular case, what I want to do is I want to multiply both sides by essentially e to the minus j and omega naught t. And just note the slight distinction here is we take this, but k is the index of this summation. So we, we can't really use that when we're multiplying both sides. So we're gonna have to just multiply by a new variable, general variable, n, okay? And so we're gonna multiply both sides of this equation by this and hope that stuff is gonna cancel out. So let's take a look at what this, this might look like. So we're gonna do this multiplication and then we're also going to integrate over one period, all right, to isolate. That integral is going to help us because CK is within the summation. 
So I'm going to integrate both sides. So let's take a look. OK. Let me see what color I should use here. Let's just use black. All right, we're going to start with the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, so the left-hand side is simply multiplying by the complex exponential here and then doing the integration over a period. So that's just doing exactly what we said. The right-hand side now, when we apply that, we need to simplify this to hopefully some sort of form where we can isolate CK. So let's take a look. So we have this integral over a period. What's the first thing we can do? Well, the first thing we can do is we can actually go ahead and simplify. There's no reason for this parentheses here. That's just written uh, for notational convenience. So we can simplify that parentheses. Okay. We can simplify that parentheses by essentially having a summation. This is going to be CK. Now this becomes e to the j k minus n omega naught t. All right. So now uh, that we have it in this form, it turns out that what we can do is because this integral is with respect to dt, I can actually rearrange this integral by moving the sum outside. All right, so now all I've done here is I've just moved the integral to be more precisely uh, ar arranged to where it's only integrating the stuff that depends on time t, right? So I can move the sum and the ck outside. So now that I've moved the sum and the ck outside, we can actually simply calculate this integral using our previous result. So I'm actually going to go on the previous page, and just for convenience, I will rederive it here. So we're just going to look at this component here. So we have some space on this page. So what we can do is if we're going to integrate over one period, let's have a period here, t naught, because capital T naught, I want to see what is the integral of this e to the j k omega naught t e to the minus j n omega naught t dt. And of course, that equals the integral from t naught, t naught plus capital T naught of e to the j k minus n omega naught t, right? But remember that this integral is something we just did on the previous slide. So it's just using different variables, uh, k, k and net. So in this particular case, if this term here equals 0, what that means is that k equals n. So there's two cases we need to consider. Case one is, I'll use the same colors as before, right? We use red. So if k equals n, and in blue, we will use the term if k is not equal to n. And so in this particular case, if k is not equal to n, I'm going to have a 0, right? Because I'm integrating sinusoids over a period. But if k equals n, then in this particular case, I just end up with t naught. So we can apply the same insight to this breaking this integral here as follows. So this, if I apply the same insight, this is going to equal. So remember, we need to do it for two cases. So if So if k equals n, then what this equals is it equals c n t naught, right? Because the summation is now only valid at c n. Okay. And if k not equal to n, 
then this simply equals zero. So therefore, what we can say is that Cn t naught is going to equal the integral from t naught, t naught plus capital T naught, f of t e to the minus j n omega naught t dt. And to get Cn, all I need to do is divide this out. All right, so now I have solved for an arbitrary coefficient Cn. Okay, so I can solve for C1, C sub 1, C sub 2, C sub 3, and so on until I get this. So these are the Fourier coefficients, and they demonstrate that indeed a periodic signal can be written as a sum of complex exponentials. So in the next slide, what we're going to do is we're actually going to go through an example of this, a concrete example. So here's a function called a square wave. It's a quite a common function. If you're transmitting data over a, a bandwidth line, it's, it's something that you might have. And our goal is going to be to calculate the Fourier series for this. So we want to calculate uh, the coefficient CK. Uh, for this particular signal. So the first thing I need to do is I first need to understand what is the period, fundamental period, and then I need to uh, just define the signal over that period. So if I look at this uh, single period, we can look at it from minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, right? That's one valid period here. Okay, so this is your signal over one period. So it's got a period of one second. And what we can do then is we can redefine the function over that one period as follows. The square wave of t is either 0 from minus 0 0.5 to minus 0 0.25 and 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, right? This is just kind of a heuristic for how to define this segment of the curve, right? You can write it as this piecewise function here. Now, let's say we want to calculate the Fourier series. I just want to be clear, you can always calculate the Fourier series from this small single period, right? You don't need to worry about now the rest of the wave to calculate the Fourier series because the function is periodic. Okay, so to calculate the Fourier series, we once again simplify it to two cases. K equals zero, like the Fourier series, series coefficient C sub zero, and the general Fourier series coefficient C sub K right, where k is not equal to zero. So um, for our square wave, we have that the fundamental period is one second. So if k were to be equal to zero, then you would end up with the following equation. C sub k is being defined as one over t naught times, uh, you know, the integral of f of t times the complex exponential. So this is something that we just derived on the previous slide. So now what it's time to do is it's time to take this equation and write it specifically for C sub zero. So if we want to write this for C sub zero, well, all we have to do is just say that C sub zero, I just put a zero there, equals one over T naught integral from, in this particular case, I'm integrating over a period, right? We decided to integrate from minus 0 0.5 to plus 0.5, all right? And I'm going to integrate that function s of t specifically. And remember that k equals 0. So this is going to be equal to minus j times 0 times omega naught times t, all right, dt. So this, if we just simplify it out, equals 1 over t 0 integral from minus 0.25 to 
to 0.25. That's the only part of the signal where it's it's not zero. So I can rewrite the limits as that times one because S of t is one there times one because e to the j zero times omega naught t is, is one dt. And this equals nothing but one over two t zero, which equals one half because t zero is one for this particular signal. So therefore, c sub zero equals one half. So now we have first calculated k equals zero. Now let's calculate for k not equal to zero. All right, so when k is not equal to zero, once again, we still have that in this particular case, t zero equals one, the fundamental period is one, therefore omega naught equals two pi. So when k is not equal to zero, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have this integral, but we need to write it in a more general form. So this integral can be written as one over t zero integral from minus 0.5 to plus 0.5 of s of t e to the minus j dt. Right. All I've done is I've just plugged in my specific function s of t. And so if I have my specific function s of t, remember that I only need to consider it when s of t is one, so that equals the integral from minus 0.25 to plus 0.25 of e to the minus j k 2 pi t. So here we have simply just just for brevity, we have skipped some steps, right? We know that t0 is one. So I just removed the one, one over t0 from the beginning. Uh, we know that s of t is one, so I haven't written that explicitly. Uh, we have substituted in, uh, you know, k uh, omega naught equals two pi. So we don't have an omega naught in this, in this term, okay? All right, so now we can simply compute this integral. So if we compute this integral, we end up with the following. And so this integral, we can expand it into the cosine form, right, using Euler's. This is equal to 1 over jk 2 pi multiplied, use a different uh, color here, cosine of k pi over two minus j sine minus Okay, so all we've done is we've expanded this out. And in this particular case, we can clearly see that these two terms are gonna cancel, right? These two terms right here is gonna cancel with this term.
so now really what I'm going to get is I'm going to actually get my that my function is going to be equal to minus one over jk to pi times minus 2j times sine of k pi over 2. Okay. And this simplifies to sine k pi over 2 divided by k pi. So here is your derivation for the Fourier series coefficients when k is not equal to 0. And by the way, those of you who are wondering why we have a have to break the derivation into k equals zero and k not equal to zero, well, it's because sometimes you will get undefined, you will have a k in a denominator, and then you know you'll have an undefined value in the math. So that's why it's very useful to break it up right, right about here. If you just look here, if we had tried to use this general form uh, to instead of breaking it up into k equals zero and k not equal to zero then we would have run into that error. All right, so uh, this is your expression for the Fourier series coefficients for any CK uh, for K not equal to zero for that segment of the square wave. It turns out that this is actually, uh, this may be a little bit beyond the scope of this class, but the, this particular coefficient representation is a very common one. Uh, this signal that we've, sort of highlighted in red here is called a boxcar function. It's like a pulse. Uh, if you think about a transmitter, like a LIDAR that's sending a boxcar to the scene, because we cannot send a Dirac, we actually end up sending a boxcar. And so it's very useful to know the Fourier series representation of a boxcar, because that's what it looks like in the frequency domain. We will talk more about this when we talk about Fourier transforms, but for now, just file it away. All right. so. We have done this, and we have gotten this sine k pi over 2 divided by k pi. This is a very, very special um, signal. It's called a sync function. Right? When I have a, a you know, sine pi, over, pi t over pi t occurs really frequently in signal processing, so we give it its own name. So remember from the last slide, we had calculated something like this. Right, we had CK, let's write it here. We had CK equals sine of pi K over two divided by pi K. Right, we had that from the last slide. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply this by one. So we'll multiply it by one half divided by one half. Right? It's a perfectly valid multiplication. Now, if I write this, I can rewrite it as uh, one half times sine pi k over two, pi k over two. And this, using this formula right here, this is nothing but one half times the sink function of k over two. Right. So the sink function, if I plot it against time, so here I'm plotting sink of t, it kind of looks like these ripples with a, a big kind of Gaussian bulge, almost like a Gaussian bulge in the center. Uh, it's a very special form. If you, one of the largest companies, actually UCLA uh, Samueli School of Engineering, right, is named after Henry Samueli. And the reason this school is named after him is because he started a company called Broadcom, which, uh, you know, has a, multi-billion dollar company and Broadcom's logo for their company, if you'll see it on people who work there, the, their jackets and so on, it'll actually look exactly like, like a sink. It looks like a sink. 
So their logo has, is actually a sync because of the sort of commonality of this function. Okay. So uh, also from UCLA. So we have this sync function and some people, just so you know by convention, will also define sync of t equals sine t over t. This is perfectly valid, but it's just a, it's just a different convention. So I think kind of one half of the signal processing community defines it uh, the way I've written it above, and the other half defines it like this. In fact, uh, when I was in graduate school, I think my professors used to, in undergraduate, would define it the way we did here, and then my professors in graduate school would define it a different way. So typically what you'll often see in, in papers or in classes is that we just simply establish one convention and then stick with it for the rest of the class. So for our class, the convention is as follows, what's been boxed. We will not use uh, sine t over t. So note that sync of zero equals one, just as an FYI. Okay. Now, what we can do is we can actually plot the Fourier series coefficients. But right? remember from the last slide, that we had some CK. In general, the coefficient CK equals 1 half times the sink of K over 2. So we can simply plot that for a different case, right? So if k equals zero, remember the sink of zero equals one. So c sub zero equals one half, right? So here we have k equals zero. And if k equals one, then effectively we're gonna have We're going to be summing up this um, uh, this sinusoid, which has been scaled by uh, one half times the sink of one half. Okay. So these are your two sinusoids. This constant term here is also technically a sinusoid. Right? It's, a, it's technically a complex exponential, but it's it's uh, it's got k equals zero, right? So it becomes e to the zero equals one. So if I add up these two sinusoids, the flat line and as well as the sinusoid, uh, what I'm going to end up with is I'm going to end up with this red curve here on the bottom, shown on the bottom. So this red curve is pretty close approximation. It's a pretty close approximation to the square wave. Now, how can we make this approximation better? Well, we can use, make this approximation better by actually bringing in more coefficients, right? So if we use three complex exponentials, so here we have again k equals zero, then we have k equals one for the regular sinusoid, and then we have chosen the third sinusoid here. Now if we add up all of these together, once again, we're gonna get an approximation, but this approximation is gonna be even closer to the square wave. And this theme will continue, I can add up Fourier series with 10 complex exponential frequencies, and I'm gonna get an even better approximation. I can add up 100 complex exponential frequencies, and now my approximation will be almost perfect. So in general, you are unlikely to, uh, you know, approximate any f of t perfectly, even if you use an infinite number of sinusoids, but you can get very, very close, and for all you know, almost any pragmatic or practical purpose, you will do well enough. All right, so let's finish off the lecture by doing a few more examples to give some familiarity with the Fourier series. So let's take the sawtooth signal. The sawtooth signal is another fairly fundamental signal. So the sawtooth signal is one that is defined as uh, t mod t, okay, t modulo t. What does that mean? So if I have, for example, uh, 1.5 mod 1, what does this equal? 
So this is quick check your understanding. Quickly try to compute 1.5 times modulo 1. Okay, welcome back. So modulo is simply the remainder, right? So it means that if I divide, you know, some number by modulo one, then what I'm effectively doing is I'm taking the decimal point, the value of the decimal. So it's 1.5 divided by one plus the remainder. So this is gonna equal 0 0.5. So in this particular case, I have a sawtooth signal plotted here below. Okay. The sawtooth signal is defined as T mod T. And if, you, if I plot T mod T, this is what it's gonna look like as a curve. So I have T mod T plotted here. Now, if I wanna calculate the Fourier series coefficients, we simply apply the exact same logic that we did before. Let's First, calculate the Fourier series coefficients for C sub zero, that is when k equals zero. So I've written down the shortcut here, right? C sub zero equals integral from zero to one of T e naught dt. Now, we got here because remember that the general form for calculating C sub k is one over T naught times the integral from T naught T naught plus capital T naught. And in this particular case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be integrating from here. I'm gonna choose this period to integrate over, okay? And so this is T naught equals zero. And this is T naught plus T zero, which equals one, right? Because T zero equals one. And this is gonna be my function S of T, the segment that I'm gonna choose. So S of T in this particular case is gonna equal T in this interval. So now if I were to write my general expression F of T E to the minus J K omega naught uh, lowercase t dt, you can see how we got from this equation to this equation, okay? To the general Fourier series coefficient to the specific one for C naught. Specific one for C naught for the specific signal taken over this specific interval, right? So now if I simply just compute this, I just compute this integral as T squared over two, and it becomes evaluated as a definite integral with value one half. Now, what becomes more interesting is perhaps when K is not equal to zero. So when k is not equal to zero, we end up with this form for ck. So we end up with ck equals integral from zero to one of t e to the minus j k omega naught t dt. And those of you who may see this will recognize this immediately as, as an integral that we need to compute using integration by parts. So here, this is u, and then this part here would be db. So integral of u dv equals u v minus integral v du. So the rest of the steps are on the slide. You're welcome to follow along. But basically what happens is if you use integration by parts when k equals zero, you end up getting a final form somewhat, somewhat similar to this equation right here. And in this particular case, you can actually simplify it. Simplifies to CK equals J two pi. Okay. All right. So from the last slide, we had j over two pi, right? j over two pi k is the, uh, uh, is 
CK, uh, the general form for CK. And you see that right here, right? This is the general form for CK multiplied by, of course, the complex exponential with the constraint, with the constraint that K not equal to zero. And then of course, we wanna add back our C sub zero. So this is your Fourier series representation for the sawtooth that is given in this equation. Okay. Okay, very good. So here's some graphical illustrations of this. In this particular slide, what I've done is here's C zero in blue. All right, C zero once again is one half. And in red, we have the coefficient for k equals one. So this is the e to the j omega naught t. And if I add up these two, I'm going to get a fairly coarse approximation shown below for the sawtooth wave. But as we saw before, if I start adding more sinusoids, so I add more complex exponentials, I get a better approximation and an even better approximation with five here. So here we're gonna use five and we do pretty well. Oops. Um, okay. Here we're gonna do 10. Here we're gonna do 100. And if you look, we are nearly uh, perfect in our approximation, although it's kind of tricky to pick up the edges. We see some slight ringing over overshoot artifacts near the edges. So in general, a question that, that might be raised is after we have shown these examples, can we definitively say that CK equals uh, one over T naught integral over the period times the function multiplied by the complex exponential, the negated complex exponential, right? Can we conclusively say that this duality holds? for every point in time t? And the answer actually is no. If you look at the derivation, we showed that this holds only in integral form, right? That, that's the only quality that we looked at. So what this means is that the Fourier series holds over an integral average, but it doesn't mean that the Fourier series holds at every single time point t. So this is the magic of the Fourier transform. It's why the derivations work because um, uh, you're not actually trying to see equality in the function f of t with the Fourier series. You're trying to see e equivalence in the integral of the function with respect to the Fourier series coefficients. And so we saw that in some examples here, uh, when we talked about the sawtooth not perfectly approximating the edges, there's some ringing overshoot. Uh, it might be more apparent here, right? If you look, on the top edge, it overshoots a little bit to the left, like, and here it overshoots a little bit to the bottom right. So if I add up these errors over, over an integral period, then I'm actually going to cancel out the errors. So that's what we saw. And we saw something similar if I were to go back to the square wave slide as well, graphically. So, the Fourier series does not equal f of t everywhere. However, it does a very reasonable job of fitting things like the square wave or the sawtooth. We won't go into too much mathematical detail on the convergence aspects of this in this particular class, maybe in graduate classes uh, that would be more appropriate. But in general, what you can try to abstract is that if you increase the number of terms, you're gonna to start to compress the ringing artifacts, but you don't reduce the amplitude of the ringing artifacts. You'll still see that the ringing artifacts are present as we go to like 100 or 1,000 complex exponential frequencies in the square wave. So different types of signals, like you know, square wave and sawtooth are two specific types. Some types of signals are better approximated with the Fourier series. So obviously, if I want to approximate a sinusoid, that's gonna be very easy to approximate, right? That's gonna be super easy to approximate with Fourier series. So this is gonna be very nicely approximated by a Fourier series. I may even need to use just, just one coefficient CK 
uh, for this. So I might just have a C0 and like a C sub one for this. That's all I need. And this is gonna have some value. Um, this is a very well-behaved signal. If you look at the sinusoid as compared to a square wave, here's a sinusoid, here's a square wave. The difference, they're actually very similar, right? They may have the same fundamental period and so on. Uh, and they may, if I overlay them, they may look similar. But what, what's really different is this little edge here, this little edge. The edge is actually something that's very hard to approximate with sine waves, right? Because sine waves are inherently smooth functions. They're like rounded functions, up and down, oscillating smoothly like, uh, like the back of a camel. But when you ask it to approximate like, uh, you know, this, this discontinuous edge, right? Uh, it can't do that perfectly. And no matter how many sinusoids you have, that's just a limitation of the sinusoidal function. So in general, there's these Dirichlet conditions for when f can be approximated and which f's are better at being approximated by Fourier series. And it really boils down to the signal being smooth, right? This edge is not smooth, it's kind of sharp. But if it were a sinusoid that you're trying to approximate, that would have been easy, okay? So that's kind of the take home message for when we can use Fourier series approximations in this class. All right. Now I want to move on to uh, one last check your understanding question. And this one is relevant from the homework assignment itself, actually. So the question is as follows. Imagine that we have uh, some Fourier series representation. Let me just make sure the video is working. Go back to Zoom. Zoom. Oops. Okay, cannot see my screen share, so just give me a moment. Um, hoping you guys can see my screen. Good. All right, so let's move on with a check your understanding question. So let's say that f of t is this nice, well-behaved periodic signal with period t naught, right? And because it's this period, you know, well-behaved periodic signal with period t naught, it should be clear that we can now approximate f of t with this expansion, right? With this Fourier series expansion. So f of t equals the infinite summation of ck times its corresponding k complex exponentials. Now the question that I have for you is if we are able to approximate f of t in this way, let's suppose that there exists some function g of t, which is gonna equal f of t plus some constant epsilon. So I'm just gonna add a number to f of t. It could be like five or 10 or 20, right? It's gonna be some constant epsilon. Now, can I say that this is approximated, right? Can g of t be approximated by a Fourier series? And if yes, what is the relation between CK and CK prime, where CK prime is the Fourier series for g of t. Right, so why don't you take a moment, maybe pause the video, and if you can straight away answer this, that's great. And if not, uh, see if you can at least think of how you might approach this. Okay, welcome back. 
So the answer is yes. Uh, G of t in this particular case has the same period of f of t. So you can approximate it. It's also a periodic function that can be approximated by a Fourier series. But remember, it's a different function than f of t. So the coefficients you know, for g of t are not guaranteed to be exactly the same as f of t. That's why we've said that the coefficients are ck prime. So in this particular case, we know that, you know, I'm going to write in the top right-hand side here, that in general, um, g of t is going to equal, the first part of this question is give, gives us the following, the integral over, the summation over k of ck prime, some coefficient ck prime, e to the j k omega naught t. All right. So we have now an expression for g of t in terms of Fourier series. And we got this expression because we simply just answered this question, right? We know that it can be, oh shoot, it's, um, give me one second. The video has, okay, let me try to write, we're good. All right, so remember, we've answered that the answer here is yes. That's the answer. So since this answer is yes, then I'm more than welcome to write g of t summation over k of some ck prime e to the j k omega naught t. Okay, so I'm more than welcome to write that. Now, now that I have this g of t, I want to really understand what is the relationship between ck and ck prime. So in order to do that, I'm not going to just get meaning by just going and staring at these two equations forever. I need to somehow rearrange the left-hand side to match the right-hand side. And I can do that as follows. So what I can say is that g of t, I need to just express this in terms of f of t, right? So g of t equals f of t plus some constant epsilon. Now this is going to equal c sub zero plus epsilon plus integral of k not equal to zero of c k e to j k omega dot t. Right? We simply just used right here this equation right here. So we simply substituted f of t for this equation. All right, so now we have the tools to solve this problem. We can see that in order for, uh, you know, um, in order to understand a relationship between CK and CK prime, what we see is that the epsilon here only affects the term C0. So C0 prime equals C0 plus epsilon. The other terms here are not affected. Okay, so the answer to this question is that ck prime is equal to ck for k not equal to zero and c not plus epsilon if k equals zero. So to just get one more interpretation of why this, this holds, if we look at this equation here, um, this here has this here is being multiplied by the zero complex exponential. We're really multiplying this by e0, e to the zero. And so the only constant ck that can affect how we scale e sub e to the zero is c sub zero. Right. If I change any of these other terms right here, if I change any of these other terms here, they're only going to impact how we multiply that particular complex exponential. So the only difference between f of t and g of t is in the scaling of the zero complex exponential e to the zero. So that's one intuitive way to look at this. So in general, and I think there will be some practice problems on the homework on this, you should be able to understand if I do arbitrary transformations to f of t, here I've just shifted f of t 
shifted the range of f of t by adding a scalar constant, right? But I can do other types of transformations to the signal. I can do a domain transform. Like I could flip the signal, right? Or do symmetries or shift the signal. So we could apply our signal transformations that we learned earlier and see how that impacts the Fourier series coefficients. Okay, so once again, please remember to vote in that poll if you get a chance. And we'll see you in the next lecture. We will go one layer deeper into Fourier series and potentially also cover Fourier transforms. Thanks a lot for your time.